for us to have Honorable Sardar Asif Ahmed Ali Sir, former Foreign Minister of Pakistan and the Chairman of the OIC, Lord Kurban Ahmed, Lord Tariq Ahmed, Air Marshal Wiles from the Royal Air Force, Lauren Pringle, the President of the Oxford Union, distinguished members of the business community, and my dear fellows and colleagues. As the President of the Oxford University Pakistan Society, I welcome you all to the Pakistan Future Leaders Conference 2012. Today, we have among us almost 300 delegates from 45 different universities from all across the country. We have among us the students, professionals, policy makers and academics from across the country representing more than 25 organizations and also the top universities within the country. A lot of effort has been made to make this event possible. I would particularly like to thank our partners Cambridge University Pakistan Society and the SOAS Pakistan Society for their contribution. I would also like to thank Oxford Union who have provided this historic and prestigious platform for this conference. Distinguished members of the business community and the members of the alumni of our society who donated generously to make this conference possible. Last but not least, we would like to express our warm gratitude to our media partners, GeoTV Network and the Jung Group for fully supporting us in this endeavor. The Oxford University Pakistan Society has been in existence for the last 50 years and has a strong tradition of promoting and furthering the cause for a progressive and truly democratic Pakistan. And it is with this in mind that we have taken the initiative along with the SOS and Cambridge Pakistan societies to initiate a program aimed towards fostering a culture of forward-looking debate, coexistence and mutual respect. I emphasize on you to open your minds and partake in Oxford's rich tradition of debate, critical analysis and freedom of speech. And what better place to start this process than the historic debating chamber of the Oxford Union, which over the years has become a symbol of free speech and liberal ethos. And on this ending note, I would like, first of all, to invite Ms. Lauren Pringen, the President of the Oxford Union, to say a few words. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It falls upon me to welcome you here to the Oxford Union. We are so very pleased that you could all make it and join us here this weekend. So thank you very much. I would say Pakistan and the Oxford Union have a long history of working together with Benazir Bhutto as a former president um, while she was here studying at Oxford. And I'm so pleased to be able to see that partnership continuing whilst I'm president. So it just finally, I'd just like to say welcome and have a fantastic weekend. So I would like uh, to invite one of our distinguished speakers, Lord Tariq Ahmed, uh, to say a few words. And that will be followed with a few other distinguished speakers. Lord Tariq Ahmed. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. In the name of God, the gracious, most merciful. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and a very warm Assalamu Alaikum. Although I must admit uh, the word warm is something that we all can uh, focus on for a moment or two. The short walk over from the uh, car park just now was uh, scaling uh, the Antarctica perhaps in the uh, bitterness of the cold. But uh, as I said to my wife, that was soon replaced very much by the warmth of the welcome. And may I firstly say to the Oxford Union and indeed to the President of the Pakistan Society of the Oxford Union, Thank you for inviting me here. It's an absolute pleasure and indeed privilege to be here amongst you all. And to the Pakistani students, this evening and these few days are very much focused on you. 
And that is important. For in you, your focus, your attention, lies the future of Pakistan. Ladies and gentlemen, let me describe a country. Its lowest point on the Indian Ocean coast at sea level. Its highest point on the mighty K2, the world's second tallest mountain. Great cities exist in this country. For over 5,000 years, we can talk of the Indus civilization, where its rich history has seen Greeks in the guise of Alexander the Great and Persian, Persian cultures, and their historic legacy remains even today in that country. A country whose educational and historical infrastructure reflects its connection with the deep-rooted links of the days of the British Empire and the country where I'm proud to serve as a parliamentarian today. The potential of this land, and that's a crucial word, ladies and gentlemen, the potential of this land is incredible. Be it in arable terms, from the arable fields of the Punjab and Sindh, to the gemstone and mineral wealth of the northern regions. A country rich in resource, rich in people, a country of over 180 million people, where cultures, people and lands literally meet. It is one of those unique places, and by that, ladies and gentlemen, I do mean unique. Four mountain regions meet. What a unique position that God has bestowed. The country is the country of Pakistan. From the southern ports of Gwadar to the northern towns of Gilgit, from the port city of Karachi to the K2, the land of Pakistan is blessed in landscape, its natural resources, and the wealth of its most valuable resource, its people. The potential, ladies and gentlemen, is phenomenal. Yet, let us for a moment just look at the Pakistan of today. The perception, and that word is also quite important, the perception that exists of Pakistan, the picture which is often portrayed in the media, that sadly also, in certain respects, the reality on the ground in Pakistan is somewhat different. Poverty, illiteracy, corruption, and the rising tide of extremism, and the destruction of a secular, modern, progressive Islamic society through a deteriorating law and order situation is all too evident, but also of deep concern. Not just to the people of Pakistan, not just to the wider region, but to the world as a whole. And it is important that we come together, we raise a voice against this extremism. It is a global issue and it requires a global solution. And that's why, ladies and gentlemen, I am proud that the government, the coalition government, the conservative-led government of our country stands side by side with Pakistan in seeking to curb extremism, fight radicalism, but not through token gestures. You will all recall, in the not-so-distant past, the Prime Minister of our country, David Cameron, himself went to Pakistan. And in that, or in work with the government of Pakistan, more importantly, the people of Pakistan, to secure its future. It was the British government which gave close to a billion dollars of educational aid. And we continue to work with NGOs, community activists, like the incredible Idi Sahib, who I hope will be supported as we push forward, and I hope indeed he's recognised for his efforts through a Nobel Peace Prize. But it's people like him, community activists on the ground, who do not see who they seek to serve, do not see limits to the people who are in need. They see one thing, that is it's Pakistan, the people of Pakistan that are in need, and people like Idi Sahib serve unrelenting with a vision to do something greater for this country blessed with natural resource. Educational development and commerce are also important vital elements. And the people element in terms of education is where 
All of you come in. The potential, that word again, ladies and gentlemen, to realise what today lies in front of you, what you can achieve and contribute. I assure you, I stand before you, the son of a migrant who was born in India before the partition, lost everything as he moved to the port city of Karachi and came to our shores here in Britain in the early 50s. With five pounds to his name, he took the opportunity to build a life for himself, for his family, and from the extraordinary opportunities offered to him by my country, Great Britain. And it is testament to my parents' efforts, to the blessings undoubtedly of God Almighty, but also of the incredible opportunities that Great Britain in terms of educational and advancement, be it economic or social, that I am proud yet humbled to stand before you as a member of the British House of Lords. Ladies and gentlemen, and I refer particularly to the students, education is a most powerful tool. I remember, and I'll share a story with you here, when I was young, very young, some may say, I'm young now, but uh, I leave that for you to determine. <laughs> but nevertheless, by the comparison of the House of Lords, perhaps I still am. But I remember, I wasn't a great person for mathematics. And you know what? I was one of those shy, retiring types. The sound of the doorbell ringing meant Tariq legging it upstairs to his bedroom, hoping his mother or father wouldn't drag him down. But you know, I was fortunate to have parents that I did. Sitting those there on those summer holidays, getting through those fractions, sitting there welcoming guests, having to excuse myself. Gosh, what a challenge that was. But you know what? It helped, and it made me what I am today. Someone who has a background in the city of London, finance, believe it or not, and also someone who is in serving and proud to be serving in public life. But that is also testament to the opportunities education empowers you with. The ability to move forward, the ability to progress, and most importantly, ladies and gentlemen, the ability to contribute to society. And that is what Pakistan so desperately needs from all its sons and daughters. And one famous daughter who I'm proud is looking down on me today, the, of course, the late, but extraordinary Mutarma Benazir Bhutto. Education, as the founder of Pakistan said, builds character. It also builds morals. And that's exactly what today should possess. In pursuit of building a secure, a stable, an economically vibrant and prosperous and peaceful Pakistan. In this modern era, perhaps, as we look towards Pakistan and the region, it's difficult for a nation to imagine that it could exist like that. But with education, ladies and gentlemen, you can achieve. And therefore, to the students here, I say to you, excel in every field. Pakistan is full of natural resources. It is blessed, but its people, and indeed its future leaders, are the vital and final ingredient for success. Some talk in Pakistan in terms of the brain drain, which is becoming increasingly detrimental and that's detrimental for any country. Recently, I was uh, privileged to represent the government in Azerbaijan. And one of the things that struck me about the president there, he talked of the gold, the black gold of his country. But ultimately, he talked of the human gold of his people. And Pakistan, I assure you, ladies and gentlemen, you are living real practical examples of the human gold of Pakistan, the future of Pakistan. In the modern era, ladies and gentlemen, strong character, good morality are becoming increasingly qualities, and that is what our youth should aspire to. The founder of Pakistan, Muhammad Ali Jinnah, emphasized for the youth to build strong character. Through this quality, youth can easily eliminate a variety of plagues, be it corruption, fraud, the black market, for building a cleaner, vibrant Pakistan which is incumbent for any nation, and is incumbent upon all of you to help take that next generation forward. Defend human rights, stand against the persecution of people, 
strengthen democracy through meritocracy and a common electoral base. And look towards your neighbours, not with the historical eyes of enemies, but as future allies and partners to build the regional balances, the regional strength. What a powerful bloc the likes of Pakistan, India, Sri Lanka and Bangladesh could mean to the world in the future. Be true ultimately, ladies and gentlemen, to your essence of the message of the founder of Pakistan when he addressed the nation and he said three essential ingredients to success, unity, faith and discipline are a landmark, earmark for success. If I may think the president and indeed the president of the Oxford Union's indulgence in conclusion, I may, if I want, just wish to revert to Urdu, the language of Pakistan, and just addressing the students, say this. Aapke samne yo aaj ek cheez pesh ho ke hai. Aapke paas ek mauka hai. Aap ek mulk ko banai. Taaleem hai. Yo aap ki taaleem yaha seekh hai, usko apne vatan wapas leke jai. Aur yakin rakhe, agar iman aur adar ke saath aap kaam karenge, कोई दुनिया की ताकत ऐसी नहीं है जो आपको रोक सकेगी और तरक्की आपकी होगी अल्लाह ताला पे भरोसा रखें पूरी तरह और मैं ये भी इंतलाता हूं कि तरक्की मिलेगी आखिर में मेरे वालिद साहब मरहूम उनको कुछ शेर व शायरी का शौक था मैं खुद तो पैदाइशी यहां का हूं मगर इस मौके को देखते हुए आज मैंने सोचा तारिक आप भी कुछ कोशिश कर लें तो पेशे खिदमत कुछ आपकी उम्मीद है आप महजूज होंगे कुछ पैगाम है नौजवानों सुनो एक बात मेरी ओ कौम के नौजवान जागो वो जगाओ वो तस्वीर कायद आजम यो है असली वतन ए पाकिस्तान बनाओ उन जैसे बन जाओ उन जैसे यो बुनियादी साथी थे कायद के अलामा इकबाल लियात अली और जफरल्ला खान कई काम करने अपना अपना पहचानो मुल्क को हमेशा उसका नाम रोशन रखो बन जाओ तुम पाकिस्तान की पहचान क्या यो भी हो तुम्हारा मैदान वर्जशी मुकाबलाजात में बन सकते हो तो मगले जानशीर जहांगीर या इमरान या जहां बन तुम अगली आलम साइंसदान जैसे था पाकिस्तान का चमकता सतारा नोबल लॉरियट अब्दुलसलाम बना डालो इंसानियत को जमहूरियत की बुनियाद दुआ है मेरी बन जाओ तुम कौम के सच्चे और हकीकी आवाज याद रखो इंसाफ अदल और अवाम के वफा में मिल जाएगी तुम्हें असली अयाज तो ये कायद तक कायद आजम की तस्वर को तुम्हारी जिम्मेदारी है हकीकत में बदल दो वो ख्वाब जना और बन जाओ वो कायद आजम के वफादार पाकिस्तानी अल्लाह ताला हम सब को जो भी हमारी जिम्मेदारियां हैं पूरी तरह हमारे साथ रहे बना दे और मेरी दिली ख्वाहिश है कि आप अपनी तालीमी लिहाज में भी कामयाबी हासिल करें और पाकिस्तान को आपकी जरूरत है और मैं आपके लिए दुआ करूँगा और साजिश इंसान के लिए आप भी दुआ करें कि हम पूरों को अपनी जिम्मेदारी करने की पूरी तोफी अदा फरमाए वाखिर My Lordship, Lord Amin, Sardar Asif Ahmed Ahmed Arisa, the Chairman of Pakistan Society, Oxford, Chairman of uh, or the President of Oxford Union, ladies and gentlemen, Assalamu Alaikum and a very good evening to you all. First of all, let me thank the Oxford U University of Pakistan Society for inviting me here today and allowing me to share 
my thoughts with you on the subject of Pakistan future leaders. I'm not a great speaker, and English is not my first language either. I wasn't born here. I must have declared the interest. By birth, I'm a Pakistani. But I have lived here enough to be able to communicate reasonably well in all circumstances in Pakistan. Future leadership needs to be persuaded to consider education and particularly science and technology to be high up in the national priorities. I have lived in England for most of my life, but when I think about Pakistan and the challenges that it faces, I often look forward, uh, look towards other developing countries, such as Malaysia. For its success in political stability, democracy, and industrial development. I'm a great admirer of Mati Muhammad, the former Prime Minister of Malaysia, for many reasons. One of them was that the, the way he maximized the potential of young people and his close association and contact with students studying inside the country and abroad. And let me tell you a little story. Once I was traveling to London in train and I met a group of 30 or 40 Malaysian students in the train. When I asked that they were going to London where their Prime Minister at the time, Mahathir Mohammed, was visiting London and he had invited every one of them to get an update what they were studying, at what stage their studies were, when are they going to finish their studies, so that he can plan for them to be adjusted in the government back in Malaysia. I was very impressed. And I wished if Pakistan had similar leadership with same kind of vision. Since Pakistan is suffering from brain drain, as the, as the brightest and the most intelligent young people are not encouraged enough to serve the nation at home, and they seek better prospects in foreign countries. Pakistan desperately needs a Mati Muhammad approach in this regard. British universities have historically linked with Pakistan since many of our legend and contemporary leaders like Dr. Iqbal, Khadi Azim Muhammad Ali Jinnah, Chaudhry Muhammad Ali, Liaquat Ali Khan, Dhrushikar Ali Bhatto, Benazir Bhutto, Imran Khan and many others have been educated in Britain. And I can see I can see many of you in front of me who I hope will play a leading role in Pakistan once they go back to their studies. For those families who have already settled in the United Kingdom, and I'm sure there are some students here, of course, from the community who actually has settled here in the UK from Pakistan, they have the dual role to play. They need, need they need to make education a top priority for themselves and their children and make best use of opportunities available to them here. The aim should be not only to gain formal qualifications but also to uphold their values, traditions and heritage. Britain is a true democracy, a multicultural, a multi-faith, a vibrant and a tolerant nation. It is a land of opportunities. 
And opportunities come with responsibilities. We need to grasp the opportunities that it offers and accept the responsibilities as well. There are many success stories for those who obtained primary education from Pakistan or were born and brought up here in UK, worked extremely hard and achieved maximum in many fields and earned a good name for Pakistan. Many of the parliamentarians such as Lord Ahmed, there are many other good examples of success stories. There are many of us who are serving in international organizations at the highest level and we are proud of them too. At the end, may I say, whether you choose to excel in this country or return to Pakistan, the best. Allah Hafiz. Pleased to have among us Sardar Asif Ahmad Ali Sir, who is a stalwart of Pakistani politics. Sardar Sir has served Pakistan in a number of capacities. He remained a federal minister for over nine years and has held portfolios of education and foreign affairs, among others. Along with his distinguished political career, he is also a graduate of the St. John's College in Oxford and also a poet and a painter. His uh, book of English poetry has been published and he has also exhibited his work of painting at the national level. So, without holding you further, I would like to invite Sardar Asif Ahmadinejad to give us the keynote address. My lords, the Qurban and JDM, uh, President of the Oxford Union, President of the Oxford Union Pakistan Society, Oxonians, young students, ladies and gentlemen, I am absolutely delighted to be with you this evening. And I feel like the proverbial prodigal son having come home. Many, many moons ago, so many moons ago that I think you were not even born then, I spent my time at St. John's College. <clears throat> and those years were years of intense academic life. Intense life indeed. And one left the portals of St. John with the will to seek truth, to seek knowledge, and to serve society and human beings wherever they may be. I'm very happy to observe that in my day, the Oxford University, uh, Union Bar was a warm and a hearty place. It is still a warm and a hearty place. And this debating chamber was always a little chilly and I'm glad that you kept that tradition alive. <laughs> but in this chamber, I've heard very eminent people, far more eminent than me, but the greatest speech I've heard, in, at least in my life, was rendered from this days by the late Malcolm X. When uh, a man of great uh, stature, I also had the distinction of appearing in a movie which was shot at St. John's College in the in the. Uh, in Charles Cordrello um, by the leading actor was Mr. Gregory Peck. And I happened to 
be invited and have the honor of acting for the whole of five seconds with him. <laughs> and those five seconds were so rewarding <clears throat> that we chose not to take the compensation of five guineas, but we chose to have uh, lunch with Mr. Gregory Patrick Randolph, uh, which was indeed very rewarding and very fascinating experience. Um, Mr. President, Madam President, and Mr. President of the Society, this is indeed a unique honor for me to be invited here this evening and to share some thoughts with you. But I must warn you that a long time ago in 1991, there was a war in the Arab lands, <clears throat> which was called the 1991 War. And I happen to be a member of the Pakistan Parliament or the National Assembly. I was not a minister. It was my second or third run in the Assembly. But I was asked by the then government of British Malashri to make a speech to halt the tide of popularity which Mr. Saddam Hussein, late Saddam Hussein, had let loose in my country. And the government of the day had a serious problem. Even their own MPs and ministers would, would, would stand in the floor, on the floor of the house and speak in favor of Saddam Hussein. The opposition too was speaking in favor of Saddam Hussein. Such were the emotions. I was asked to speak and I put a condition to the, to the then Prime Minister that I must be given unlimited time to hold this time of popular support for Saddam Hussein. And this time was granted to me. Don't be too alarmed when I say that I gave the longest speech in the history of Pakistan, the National Assembly, a speech which lasted nine hours and seven minutes. <laughs> Seeing the, this distinguished audience, which is a mix of the young and the old, <clears throat> and Oxonians, I am, I must warn you, I am a little tempted to carry on now. <laughs> but then I reminded myself that wasn't it Shakespeare who said, brevity is the soul of wit. So I should be I should be influenced by Shakespeare this evening, rather than my my wishes. So while we must be brief, we also must be truthful. And when it is a question of being truthful, I think caution and discretion must be thrown to the winds. That was the lessons that we learned in the in our colleges and with our tutors. And I think it would be clear on you if I stood here and praised Pakistan's governance, the performance of its governments, the performance of its politicians, its civil servants, or its generals, I think it would be unfair on you to do that. If you were to say to me that politicians in Pakistan have been very corrupt in the last two or three decades, I would not have an argument with you. If you were to say to me that the civil servants of Pakistan by and large have been rapacious, I don't think I'll argue with you again on this score. If you were to say to me <clears throat> that the generals of Pakistan armed forces have led the country astray, I would not have an argument with you. If you were to say to me that the mullahs 
have distorted Islam and used it to strengthen themselves financially and politically, I would not have an argument with you. I would agree to whatever you say, whatever such statements make. And I would then argue that I think something in 1947 India was partitioned. It was broken into India and Pakistan. I think that, that's an event which is probably one of the most unique events in the, in the annals of history anyway. And it brought the best out of the people of Pakistan. When there was nothing in the coffers, the administration was weak, the armed forces were weak, there were no revenues, and yet the country survived those two to three years and because it had the will to survive. It was a compulsion to survive. And then, then what later transpired in Pakistan, we deviated from what would have been the, the foundation, the genesis of Pakistan, the, the philosophical genesis of Pakistan, which were to be based on two foundation documents to inspire this country to, to play the role that it was meant to play, was the last sermon of the great prophet of Islam, Muhammad, peace be upon The last sermon is not about Muslims. It's not a message for the Muslim Ummah. The last sermon of the Prophet was about humanity. All humanity. It is the most inclusive statement that I have ever read in, in any civilization anywhere. Nothing could be more inclusive than the last khutbah, khutbah to Buddha than the Prophet. Had that been the spring of inspiration for Pakistan, we would not have erred. We would not have deviated so far away from that noble message. The other document that should have been the, the foundation stone of the country was the first khutbah. I would not, should not call it khutbah. The presidential address of Mr. Jinnah to the Constituent Assembly of Pakistan. In 1947, this presidential address he made it very clear what sort of Pakistan he wanted. And I would like to quote, hopefully correctly, I don't know exact words, but if I recall this is what he said, that you may go to your temples, you may go to your churches, you may go to your mosques or any other places of worship that you choose. That shall have nothing to do with the business of state. I think if we had been truthful, if we had been sincere, important documents and if we had been sincere to the poetry of Muhammad Iqbal, who we call Ilam Iqbal, then this is not where we would have been in Pakistan. Now the interest, interesting thing is that this is the only country in the world <clears throat> that was inspired by the poetry of a poet. Pakistan was the inspiration of a poet. So this should have taken us to, to great heights, but it did not. Something went wrong somewhere. And we need to understand what went wrong. I think what went wrong 
in my own view, that we converted the state, which was composed of the East and West, and of people of great diversity in languages, ethnicity, cultures, subcultures, and very tolerant subcultures. Pakistan was a very tolerant country. It is, it, it is an inheritor of the Indus Valley civilization. So from that tolerance, something went wrong, and we took the wrong path. And what path did we take? We converted this tolerant Muslim society into a religious society. The state of Pakistan chose to turn it into a religious state. And so it was put into the constitution. And ultimately we have the constitution, which has all the elements of a modern federal parliamentary democracy. But we predicated that on religion. And I think that's where we went wrong. Why? Because an ideological state will inevitably fall into the hands of ideologues. We open the doors to ideologues, the mullahs. So the mullah came out of the mosque. He had no contribution in the making of Pakistan. It's not the mullah who made Pakistan. Mullah opposed Pakistan to Thinde. He did his damnest that Pakistan should not be made. But despite his use of the mosque, despite his lies from the pulpits, despite his thundering of the verses of the Holy Quran, to his own ends, Pakistan was made. When Pakistan got made, then we decided to unmake the Pakistan Jinnahit field by turning it into a religious state, by turning the constitution into a religious constitution. As I said earlier, a demo, an ideological state will be run by ideologues. If you look at Iran, it's run by their mullahs, the clergy. The clergy runs Iran. The, the Commissar ran Soviet Union, the communist system. The party secretary run the Chinese Communist Party. So the moment you have an ideological state, you will have this ideologues and commissars and the mullahs to run it for you. And this is, I think, where we heard. One of the great, uh, uh, the, the great uh, setbacks of Pakistan was, uh, this heard me hear by Sparshan, very impressed with what he had to say. Uh, we are, are very proud of our armed forces as well. We had one of the best, of the most professional armies in the world. We turned that professional army into an ideological army. So when you turn a professional army into an ideological army, then the professionalism, the excellence, the training, then something goes wrong with profession because then it's a prof it's to serve an ideological problem. And then the mullahs were very excited about it. They were able to penetrate into the armed forces and were able to influence the thinking, the thought process of the entire army. Now having said all this, where did it take us? It took us into <clears throat> quarrels with our neighbors, uh, quarrels with India. It took us into quarrels with Afghanistan, where we became a front-line front state. We were able to help the, the Western world to defeat the Soviet Union, which was aim of the uh, 
American President Ronald Reagan to destroy the evil empire. So we became the biggest, uh, the biggest uh, contributor and the biggest participant in this war empire. And foolishly, the then dictator Zelda opened the doors to all criminal elements in the Muslim world who labeled, labeled themselves as jihadis. They were collected from all over the world, they were trained, and then, then they were let loose in Afghanistan to fulfill an agenda which was not the agenda of Pakistan, which was the agenda of the Cold War. I am one of those who sat in the National Assembly in 1987 and I was a member of the opposition then. I said we have bought a bad story from Washington. This is not the story of Pakistan. This is not a story we should have pursued. I spoke for about an hour and a half that the evil empire of the Soviet Union was not about to reach the warm water of the Arabian Sea. This is not what they were doing in Afghanistan. And I analyzed for the, the parliament that what had really gone wrong in, in the Soviet Union. And what had really gone wrong was the empire, the Soviet empire, like all other empires at some point or the other, become top heavy, become unsustainable, become too expensive, and the people of their empire suffer because there's nothing left for people. Everything goes into to pursuing the goals and the aspirations of that empire. And those that in the Soviet Union, it is called the nomenclatura. A, a group of about 150,000 people who were walking away with most of the resources of the Soviet Union and spending huge amounts of money on wars in distant, distant lands and supporting revolutionary regimes all over the world. So consequently there was nothing left for the people of Soviet Union. And the whole empire was on the verge of collapse in the mid-80s. And the Central Asian states were the soft underbelly of that empire. So out of fear and insecurity, they had to move into Afghanistan to prevent <clears throat> any penetration of the southern Russian republics from the south. We misread, misread that. And I said this, as I said earlier, in a speech to the Pakistan parliament, that we have made a serious error, gentlemen, or perhaps a military dictator wanted his legitimacy. Military dictators, unfortunately, that is why democracy doesn't seem to work in Pakistan. Because half the time we've had military dictators running our lives. And military dictators have never been given the mandate by the people of Pakistan. They, they come in, they hold a referendum if nobody goes to vote. Then they go running to Washington and some opportunity on the, on the world stage presents itself and they market that opportunity to get legitimacy from Washington. And Washington then also It's not working for the welfare of the people. It's not working for the development and progress of the country. It is working for its own agendas, which is some sort of a strategic depth in Afghanistan, ambitions in Kashmir and India, and I'm not saying we talk about Kashmir, we must talk about Kashmir. We've got a wonderful case on Kashmir. 
but to, to put the entire progress of Pakistan and the future of Pakistan and turn it in, into hostage. <laughs> if people of Pakistan are remaining hostage to a dispute, then I think it's, it's unjust, it's unfair to people of Pakistan. They must live lives in ignorance because the youth have been let down. The state of Pakistan has not done a, a thing for the youth of Pakistan. The state of Pakistan has done nothing for the health of the people. So some minor disease conflagrates into an epidemic and hundreds of people die. And the state of Pakistan has not done anything for their health, anything for their education, for providing services, utilities, electricity, gas, water, clean drinking water. Most of the people of Pakistan do not have the facility of clean drinking water. 